ਕੀ ਹੋਊ ਮੈਂ ਅਕਾਉਂਟ ਟੂ ਦਾ ਤੇ ਪੇ ਮਾਰ ਦਾ ਗੁੱਡ ਈਵਨਿੰਗ ਐਂਡ ਗੁੱਡ ਮਾਰਨਿੰਗ ਟੂ ਆਲ ਆਵਰ ਸਟੂਡੈਂਟਸ ਐਂਡ ਲਿਸਨਰਸ ਆ ਵਿਸ਼ ਯੂ ਆਲ ਦ ਬਲੈਸਿੰਗਸ ਆਫ ਦ ਨੋਬਲ ਟ੍ਰਿਪਲ ਜਿਮ ਐਂਡ ਟੁਡੇ ਵੀ ਆਰ ਹੀਅਰ ਟੂ ਅਟੈਂਡ ਆਵਰ ਲਾਸਟ ਸੈਸ਼ਨ ਔਨ ਥਿਸ ਸੀਰੀਜ਼ ਆਫ ਦਾਮਾਪਾਦੀ ਸਟੱਡੀਸ i'm glad that you know many of you stay through the uh, uh, all series and today uh, will be our um, the the verse that i have selected as the sixth verse uh, in our series and uh, i will um, so before we start i would like uh, all of us to get together and then uh, take a moment and then pay our gratitude and pay our tribute to uh, the supreme buddha because this uh, this wonderful wisdom came from the buddha and through the early disciples of the buddha and then through many generations of the disciples of the buddha so we are so fortunate today we have uh, these teachings and we have to be grateful so we will put our palms together and then recite a namaskar to pay our homage to the buddha नमो तस् भगवतो अर्हतो सम्मा संबुद्धस् नमो तस् भगवतो अर्हतो सम्मा संबुद्धस् नमो तस् भगवतो अर्हतो सम्मा संबुद्धस् our verse today is the verse number 259 that is on the chapter of the righteousness or dhammatta vagya so let me uh, chant this verse first uh and then uh, we will read the meaning and then from there we will go into the details नेतावता धम्मधरा सवे धम्म दरो होती यो धम्मं न पामंजती वन डस नॉट अपहोल्ड द धम्म मेली बिकॉज वन स्पीक्स अ लॉट ही हु आफ्टर हियरिंग अ लिटिल धम्म and realizes it directly through his or her own track own experience and is never negligent of the dharma is indeed the upholder of the dharma so in in brief this uh, gatha is telling us the the upholder of the dharma or someone who is is who is who is worst in the my true sense is not necessarily the one who knows a lot of facts about the dharma but one who maybe only knows a little bit but has practiced it and realized it in his own experience and such a person is a true uh upholder of the dharma or true uh 
that, uh, that the person who's truly versed in the Dhamma. So here this gatha is actually emphasizing the importance of practicing what we are learning because the, the teachings of the Buddha is something to be uh, practiced and verified and experienced by ourselves. Uh, so uh, this was guiding and encouraging and us to you know uh, go into practice. And uh, so I decided to select this verse uh, to conclude you know our this series current series uh, because we are, we have been learning quite a bit. Uh, during our past uh, weeks, uh, I thought that this would be a, you know, a nice way to end this series, uh, emphasizing and encouraging you to practice you know, what we have learned. Uh, and then uh, through practice, we get a, a whole different, deeper understanding of what we have you know, heard or learned or discussed. And the, the whole goal of learning the Dhamma is actually to practice it and then uh, experiences it and then reach benefit from it. The true benefit of the Dhamma come when we truly start to practice. So, so that is the, you know, uh, the simple meaning of this verse. Uh, let us try to you know, um, discuss details of this and then find, uh, encourage ourselves more uh, into our practice. And uh, so there are a few Pali terms that I would like you to be familiar with in this uh, word, in this gatha. Uh, one is here we have this term Dhamma Dharo, upholder of the Dhamma, or someone who bears the Dhamma, uh, someone who um, embodies the Dhamma. Dhamma Dharo, Dhamma Dharo, the upholder of the Dhamma. So, uh, so what this verse is saying that a true Dhamma Dhara is not someone who is knowledgeable about the, the, the facts or the teachings of the Buddha. The true Dhamma Dhara is, is someone who has experienced the Dhamma in his own practice, um, uh, even a little, you know, the knowledge, not a little Dhamma knowledge uh, he or she ha had. So the true Dhamma Dhara is someone who actually practices and, and realizes the Dhamma in his own experience. Not necessarily someone who is very, very knowledgeable about the, the teachings of the Buddha. So Dhamma Dhara, the upholder of the Dhamma. And there are two other terms uh, that are connected here. Uh, so here, we have this term, you know, upper and then bahu. They are opposite meanings. Upper means, you know, uh, little. Uh, that's uh, so we, um, we 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 saw in the in this verse, uh, a pumpy like uh, someone know a little bit of dharma, but he has practiced it, and that in that sense he's actually holding the dharma or uphold upholding the dharma. And bahu is to mean a lot. Bahu. Bahu basati, one who speaks a lot. So up and bahu uh, appears as uh, two terms uh, that, that, uh, that, that can function as opposites. And the other important term here is pasati. Pasati is a verb and uh, it means cease. Uh, when we see with our eyes, we we we, we call it pasati. Uh, but sometimes term pasati is also used in um, in in, uh, in Pali uh, usage uh, to mean directly experiencing it. Uh, so of course, when you directly see it with your own eyes, and you have direct experiences of it. So it possibly can mean we can stand for seeing it with our own eyes or actually experiencing with our own body and mind. Uh, and uh, here in this verse, uh, it says that one who actually you know really sees or experiences in his own body uh, is one who truly upholds the Dhamma. So related to pastor, there's a there's a famous. Uh, 
prayers from Pali. Uh, it's called uh, Yo Dhammang Pasati So Mang Pasati. Sorry, actually, there's a spelling mistake here. So, Yo Dhammang Pasati So Mang Pasati. You know, the, this last A should be I. Um, so, Yo, yo Dhammang Pasati So Mang Pasati. Uh, this is a very famous statement by the Buddha. Uh, Buddha said, The one who sees the Dhamma sees me. Um, so I think that's an interesting story um, uh, of a monk uh, by the name of Wakali. You may have heard about this monk uh, at the time of the Buddha, who is who is really you know uh, uh, amazed by the, the 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 appearance of the Buddha. You know, and uh, Buddha was you know uh, was was uh, physically you know the Buddha's body was fully built and. And uh, due to his, you know, paramita uh, and then, you know, good merits, you know, he got a uh, uh, really, you know, attractive uh, body as a prince. So Venerable Vakali was, uh, was, was really fond of seeing at the Buddha. We, and because we know that in um, uh, Buddha had 32 special marks on his body uh, to indicate that he's a special, you know, being. Um, so, so Venerable Wakali used to, you know, follow the Buddha and always keep looking at the at the body of the Buddha. Uh, so, after realizing, you know, how uh, after realizing this monks is following the Buddha, one day Buddha, you know, um, had a had a uh, conversation with him, and after you know um, he revealed that I, I'm 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 so um, uh, Pleased to be with you. I really like the way you conduct yourself. I really like to see your beautiful image of the body. Um, but then Buddha said that, you know, by following me, by just looking at my body, you will never see me. You will, you know, you will never really understand who is the Buddha by simply, you know, looking at my image, uh, looking at my body. So if you truly want to see me, Learn the Dhamma, uh, practice the Dhamma, and realize this Dhamma in your own body and mind. When you seize the Dhamma, and then you will see me. Uh, so that's a famous uh, saying of the Buddha. So that in that statement also we find this term pasati to mean to see and di or direct experiences. Okay, so let's move to the uh, meaning of other parts of the verse. Uh, so here I would I want to highlight that actually the learning, listening to Dhamma and learning the Dhamma the, is the first step. Um, and uh, so here in this verse, uh, there's encouragement for someone to practice the Dhamma and then directly experiences it for oneself. But we it's, it's not really it's, uh, denying the importance of learning. So therefore, I, I want to highlight, you know, the 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 balance that we need to maintain uh, between learning and practicing, between you know uh, listening and learning from others, and then experiencing it within oneself. So the, the we should not give up learning or listening to the Dhamma, uh, but we need to understand that learning and listening is only the first step. It's in this dispensable, unavoidable step. But it's not the end. It's not the end. But it's, 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 the, it's the important step. But it's only the first step. So here, uh, in order for us to understand how important is the learning and the listening to the Dharma, uh, here we uh, we find in the Anguttara Nikaya, where Buddha explains in the importance of the first step of our Dharma practice, which is to learn or uh, the Dhamma through listening, or in, in, uh, in modern time, reading the sutras. Uh, so this is what uh, it uh, uh, what appears in the Anguttara Nikaya. Those teachings that are good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, with right meaning and praising, which proclaim the perfectly complete and pure spiritual life. Such, such teachings as this, he has learned much of, retained in mind, recited verbally, investigated mentally, 
and comprehending them theoretically. Okay. So this is the first step in our practice. So we, we really need to listen to them and learn them. But here you see Buddha said there are a number of steps even in that first, st first stage. There are a number of other steps. First, we need to learn. And then we need to retain uh, what we learn in, uh, in our mind, which means that we should learn, we should also remember them. You know, so uh, we should make an effort to remember the key teachings of the Buddha. Because initially we may not uh, directly realize it, pers uh, personal experience it, it takes practice, it takes for us to have, you know, a direct experience of it. Uh, so, but the, un, uh, until we had that you know, personal insight into what we have learned, we should uh, remember it. You know, we have, we have to retain in our mind. Otherwise, if we forget it, we will never even examine it or you never try to experience it. So, so remembering, the, first we have to learn and then we have to remember. And then there's another, another practice here. It says recite it verbally. You know, we should like keep reciting these important teachings that we have learned. That you know, that's one way to like uh, to 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 remember it, also reflect on it. So reciting verbally. Uh, so uh, it said parichita, vajasa parichita, uh, recited verbally. I think that is why in, in, in important of sutra chanting. Uh, when we chant sutras, we, uh, we of course, it helps us remember it. We also verbally recite it. And when you verbally recite it, you actually get a chance to have a different appreciation, different understanding of these sutras. And personally for me, I chant uh, sutras quite often. And whenever I chant these sutras, of course, we chant in Pali. And because um, I understand Pali, uh, whenever I chant uh, the same sutra that I have been chanting for many, many times, but every time when I chant, I will pay attention to some, you know, important aspect of that, you know, uh, sutra. Uh, I will get more uh, deeper appreciation of certain uh, praises, certain words, certain teachings for the Buddha. So verbally reciting uh, the sutras or what you have learned, even the verses, the Gata, Dhammapada, verbally reciting it, it it uh, giving us an opportunity to revisit that verse uh, and then have deeper understanding. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, the whole purpose of remembering the verse is investigating mentally. So that's the other one we need to do. You know, uh, we need to keep um, uh, mentally reflecting, or investigating. Manasanu um, pekkita. Uh, so investigating mentally. And then, as a result, we comprehend the teachings of the Buddha theoretically. Theoretically. Ditya Supavidya. This is where the right view comes. So we, everything starts with the right view, you know, and, and having a good grasp of the teachings of the Buddha, uh, uh, particularly on the suffering or dukkha having a good grasp exactly how Buddha has explained uh, the dukkha arises, uh, how suffering can arise, how our mind uh, operates. So having a theoretical understanding um, is the first step. So lis listening and learning the Dhamma is so helpful to establish ourselves in right view or samaditi. Uh, so the last part comprehending them theoretically really means establishing oneself in the right view, samadhiti. So learning is important, uh, listening is important, uh, but, but, but we need to understand that's only the first step. <laughs> and so then what we had to do, uh, we had to keep practicing. So this verse is saying that actually we should learn the Dhamma not for the sake of learning, that is the you know key point that this you know this gatha is highlighting. Whenever we learn the Dhamma, we shouldn't be someone who is you know gathering knowledge. I mean, of course, we we have to have knowledge, but we should learn the Dhamma not for the sake of gathering knowledge, you know, know it more and more, but actually we should learn the Dhamma for the sake of practice and learning 
or listening to the Dhamma is an aid to practice. Because what Buddha has taught us is not, not a set of beliefs that, uh, that we need to believe in. Uh, and Buddha really wanted us to, you know, uh, truly practice it and see it for ourselves. Uh, particularly, you know, in, in Buddhist, Buddhist uh, teachings are not to be believed, uh, and, but to be practiced and realized. So therefore, the whole purpose of learning is actually to practice. So what we learn from text and others should be practice and personal experience. So here, this, this verse is also helps us to understand that knowledge is different from realization and wisdom. So we, we tend to think that you know, if we know something by reading or listening, we think that, oh, I know it. You, know, um, you may have read a book about you know, um, uh, Dhamma or maybe even any other subject. Just because we read, just because we know facts, we think that I know, I know it. But in the Buddhist understanding, knowing information, knowing facts, is different from realizing it or developing wisdom. That's the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is something that we get from others. The source of knowledge is always outside. It's a text, a book, a, a, a person outside. But the source of wisdom is inside. It's coming through, you know, in a, in a you know, through, through practice, through reflection. So, so knowledge is important, but not enough for us to deeply experience the Dhamma. So uh, when you read the, uh, the, the, the Gata to venerate the Dhamma, we recite Pachatang Veditabbo Vinyuhi, uh, and that is the, you know, the last, uh, the, at the, towards the end of the uh, verse uh, that uh, we recite to venerate the Dhamma, we, found, we find this term. That means to be realized by the wise for themselves. Uh, so the one important quality, you know, characteristic of the Dhamma is actually, is, it is to be something that we need to personally verify or personally experience. So again, emphasizing to, to practice, but I mean, showing that knowledge is not necessarily realization, but knowledge is a step towards realization and wisdom. And Dhamma is something to be realized at the end. Not only something to be known in, in, term, in terms of facts, but it's to be something to be realized. So this uh, uh, was uh, help us, uh, maybe points us to have some discussion about three stages of understanding in the Buddhist um, um, literature. Uh, you may have heard about these three stages of understanding, but it's very appropriate for our discussion of this verse. So Buddha has told us actually, uh, when we understand something, there are three stages of that understanding. Uh, it, it is related to this verse. First stage is called understanding by listening. Understanding by listening, or what you call sutta maya panya. You may have heard about this earlier. So Sutta Mayapanya, understanding by listening. That is the first stage of our understanding. So first we hear the correct teachings and accept them, although we cannot fully experience it at the moment of listening, but we accept it through reading, through learning. So, and that the, we, we can call it received wisdom. So this is the first step, you know, just like, you know, we are attending this, you know, uh, a series of Dhammapadi studies, you attend Dhamma talks, you read Dhamma books, you read sutras, and then you get the first stage, understanding by listening uh, or re reading. You know, at the time of the Buddha, the, the most prominent way of learning is, is to, to listen to, from, to a teacher, but these days we can also read. And then the other one is called understanding by reflection. Understanding by reflection. That is a second stage. The same thing uh, we have heard or learned uh, is, is only the first step simply because we know facts doesn't really mean that we have fully understood it. So therefore, the second stage is called understanding by reflection. 
chinta maya panya, understanding by reflection. Once we learn the correct teachings, then we keep contemplating on them. Uh, we can compare our, our, our own experiences with this received knowledge. We can Maybe we can call it intellectual wisdom. The wisdom that we get through reflection or reflecting on what we have learned, heard. Understanding by reflection. <laughs> so, um, it's important that, you know, um, whenever we learn uh, Dhamma, whenever, whenever we learn important teachings of the Buddha uh, about, you know, good qualities, about our defilements, about, you know, how, you know, the, about human behavior, uh, about you know, how uh, how nature of our mind. When we learn uh, such important um, teachings, we should remember it and then we should keep reflecting on it uh, in our own mind whenever we whenever we you know have some time whenever we are you know doing our normal you know li living our normal life we can keep reflecting on these important facts when buddha said that craving produces suffering so that's maybe something we should keep reflecting on and then sometimes we can compare our own experiences with we can we can compare the what we have learned and our own experiences and see whether th there's any any relationship, whether that what I have learned is is shown in my own experiences. Uh, when we learn about human behavior, you know, people are driven by their habits, and most you know, um, and uh, and then when when you learn such an important teachings of the Buddha, we should compare, we should like keep reflecting on it, and then compare it with our own experiences. So the so whatever we learn. Um, uh, it should be reflected upon and constantly contemplated uh, on. Uh, and then we can compare uh, what we have learned with our own experiences. And then we go into a deeper level of understanding. So the same thing that we have listened or learned uh, through reading can achieve a whole different level of understanding by reflecting on it. Sometimes we get aha moments sometimes we get glimpses of realization when you keep you know reflecting on what you have uh, learned uh, by you know com uh, you know um, constantly you know reflecting uh, on it uh, and that that way we can really have a good realization uh, and 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 then, then of course, that's that's the second stage. And when you think about the third stage, and it's called understanding by cultivation. It's called bhavana maya panya. Uh, that means, you know, we start to experience what we have learned and reflected with our own effort in our own practice. So bhavana means, you know, cultivation, which includes meditation, uh, but also our oral practice. So the last stage is called, you know, uh, is understanding by practicing the Dhamma, uh, mainly the meditation. Uh, we can learn, you know, that everything is impermanent um, from listening and, you know, teachings of the Buddha. Buddha has explained how everything is impermanent in many ways. And then we can keep reflecting on it, you know, whenever, you know, uh, we live our life and keep reflecting on it and try to compare our own experiences you know, with uh, uh, what we have learned. And then we practice. Uh, we practice the Dhamma. And then we contemplate. We, 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 when we meditate, also we uh, try to directly experience that you know, constant uh, impermanent nature of our own uh, experiences on our own being. And then we will have a direct experience of the impermanence. Uh, and then that is the actually the the highest and deeper level of understanding. So uh, in deep meditation, for example, we experience impermanence through our calm uh, our calm mind concentrated mind concentrated mind can reveal the hidden reality and subtle processes underlying the apparent phenomena. So we can call it experiential wisdom. 
So this is what this, you know, sutta, this uh, gatha is kind of hinting at us that we should not uh, stop at the level of listening. We should not stop at the level of simply knowledge, you know, acquiring knowledge. We should go into more deeper and deeper levels of realization through constant reflection of what you have learned and also through putting that teaching into practice. So even though we know very little bit, but if we, uh, if we have put that into practice, we will go into deeper and deeper and deeper levels of realization. Sometimes we, uh, we, we don't need to learn a lot. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, but, but, but uh, going into the deeper levels of understanding the same uh, little information we knew can be very, very helpful. Okay, um, this particular verse is given by the Buddha uh, based on a very interesting story. You know, that is what we find in the commentary to Dhammapada. So we have the Dhammapada, the collection of verses of the Buddha, and then we have commentary to that Dhammapada. In the commentary, we find this story. Um, and this is, you know, um, I will briefly tell you that story. Um, so here, the, this story is about a monk called Eku Dhana. Eku Dhana, actually, it is, it is a nickname given to him because the uh, Udhana is a, is a joyful utterance. And, and this monk uh, knew just one verse. And uh, he, he has memorized one verse. He, uh, he, he knew only one verse. But... Whenever he is invited to give a Dhamma talk, he will only re recite this verse. Um, and therefore, uh, whenever he, 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 he would discuss about the Dhamma, he will just recite this verse and, and, and only through this verse he will you know, explain something. So therefore, he got this nickname, Ekudana, like one who always you know, talk about one verse, <laughs> like only knows one verse. The monk who only knows one gatha, one verse. Uh, that was his nickname. That verse is given here. This was the verse he, he knew and he always recite, always share is this verse. Uh, to the monk of lofty thoughts, heedful, training himself in the ways of silence. To such a monk, tranquil and ever mindful, sorrows come not. Yeah, of course, this verse, you know, contain, you know, quite, you know, a deep meaning. But this is the verse that this monk has memorized. And, and he always refer to this verse. He always, you know, talk about this verse. And this only thing that he knew. Um, and only, you know, the, the starting point, you know, of his discussion all the time. So, um, uh, but actually, although he, he knows only a little bit, in terms of the, you know, the width of the Dharma, uh, but he has truly practiced this verse. He has truly practiced this verse. He has attained the higher levels of spiritual attainment by simply practicing, keep practicing what this verse is in, uh, telling. So therefore, uh, he has found out actually whenever uh, he recited this verse, Whenever he um, give a Dhamma talk based on this verse, at the end of the verse, he hear the approval, the, he hear the sounds of sadhu. You know, the term sadhu, sadhu, sadhu is, is the, the sign of approval that we, you know, give uh, to uh, a teaching. Whenever he conclude, whenever he, he utter this verse in any of, in any any instance, in any in, in any instance, he will hear this uh, ut uh, this utterances of approval, sadhu and sadhu, and he was he was sometimes is not coming from the audience, not coming from the people. Later he realizes it. It actually occurred in this story that the uh, sadhu, the recitation of sadhu, comes not from the people sitting there, actually from the um, the deities, the devas, the, who inhabited in, around the trees. So it is the devas who recited this, uh, 
approval uh, sadhu three times. So whenever this monk is uh, utters this stanza, and at the end you you hear these verses, you, you hear this you know terms you know utterance of sadhu, that was you know that that has been happening. So, uh, but he lives in, in a in a forest monastery. In the forest, there were only few monks and. Uh, devotees come uh, to that, you know, uh, monastery uh, once in a while. It, it is not a crowded place, uh, very quiet place. Uh, and and but you know, this monk is practicing with other monks and you know, sharing the teachings whenever uh, people visited um, them. And the monks also sharing, you know, uh, his own uh, experience with other monks. So they had that, you know, uh, peaceful life in the in that forest monastery. One day. Uh, there were two famous monks uh, who's known for their deep knowledge of the Dhamma, happened to visit that area, and they came to spend a few days in that forest monastery. And these two monks were, were well known, and uh, these two monks were traveling to different places and you know, sharing the Dhamma with many others. And they were like you know, famous speakers of the Dhamma. So they came to you know, stay in this monastery. And then uh, uh, this monk Ekudana and other monks invited these well-known Dhamma speakers uh, to give them a teaching. Um, and then you know these monks say, "Okay, you know we, we can we can give you a, uh, uh, we can give you a Dhamma talk, we can give teaching." But then he asked, "You know, uh, there are not many people here, and um, and and how many?" how many people will listen to the Dhamma if, if we were to give a talk? And these monks say that, you know, Venerable Sir, we don't have many, you know, people here. We have some visitors, uh, supporters who come to help us. But Venerable Sir, there are a lot of deities uh, in this forest. So not only human beings, but, you know, even devas will also listen to your Dhamma talk. So therefore, please give us a Dhamma talk. So listening to that, and then, then these two monks asked, how do you know that, you know, the, the devas are listening? And he said that in this forest, when we conclude a Dhamma sermon, devas also say sadhu three times. That is how we know that, you know, these uh, devas are listening to them. And these uh, two famous monks uh, were quite happy. In that case, then we will give a uh, Dhamma talk and we will both, we, both of us will, you know, take turns and we will give uh, a good sermon, good teaching. So both monks got together and they started on a, a very important topic. And they kept talking about the Dhamma and explaining it in many ways. And after you know, quite some time, they concluded uh, their sermon, their the teachings, their Dhamma talk. But there were no utterances of sadhu came from the devas. And these fam two famous monks questioning this monk Ekudana, you told us that you know the devas say sadhu, but we didn't hear any such approval, any such sadhu. Did you tell us the truth? Are you lying? And then when this monk Ekudana said, "No, venerable sir, it happens every time. You know, we uh, even recited a, a, a verse." Uh, and then the other monks really wanted to, you know, test it and invited Venerable Ekudana <laughs> to give a Dhamma talk. Venerable Ekudana said that, Venerable Sir, I only know one verse. That's all I know. But, you know, if you request, I will just recite, I will just explain that verse. So this monk, you know, Venerable Ekudana, again, uh, 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 started to you know recite this verse and explain the verse that he has been doing many many times so he just uttered the verse that has this meaning uh and then but at that time by the time that this monk end reciting and explaining the meaning of this verse everybody was able to hear mm -hmm. the recitation of big sadhu in that forest and the two famous monks got really upset. They thought that this forest devas are very partial. They're very biased. 
they only support the monks who reside in this forest, not to this, you know, um, uh, well, not to these renowned monks. So they went back uh, in their travel. They went to the uh, to the uh, the Savati, where Buddha was living, uh, and then they reported to the Buddha. You know what happened in that forest. You know they gave a very important um, you know teaching, but you know they didn't hear this uh, term of prayer, uh, uh, approval. Uh, utterance of sadhu, but you know that one monk just uttered one verse and explained it, and he 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 we hear, we heard the sadhu, and those devas are very partial, very biased, uh, and they complained to the Buddha. But Buddha explained them why that was the case. Buddha said that that monk only knows one verse in terms of the dhamma. I mean, in terms of the knowledge of the Dhamma. But he has practiced that verse to the fullest. He has personally realized that Dhamma that is explained in that verse. So whenever that monk explained the Dhamma, whenever that monk recited the Dhamma, it comes from his own experience. It's not simply coming from his head. It's not in his knowledge, but it's also his experience. So there's a different, uh, a different flavor to such teachings. So that is why those devas say sadhu because that comes from that monk's heart not only from his head. So explain the uh, the importance of practice at the end of explaining why uh, the, the devas say sadhu three times to the monk who only knew little but has practiced and realized it. After telling, explaining this Buddha uttered this verse that we are studying today. Occur, occur in this, uh, according to the commentary. So this is story. So it shows again the importance of uh, listening and personal realizing a little bit of Dhamma that we, uh, we know. So, and, and from here, I would like to, you know, uh, also uh, uh, for you to revisit the two important, uh, the other important uh, a topic that can be related to you know this um, story, this verse. That means that there are four factors given by the Buddha uh, for someone to you know um, uh, to reach uh, the stream entry or have panya. The four factors that uh, help someone to um, uh, to have a stream entry or to have panya, and it's called. Um, the four factors. One is called associating spiritual teachers and friends. We need to have a good association. Uh, we call Sappurusa Sansava. We need to have good Kalyanamitas, good teachers. You know, that's the only way that we can have, you know, uh, true teachings of the Buddha. Spiritual teachers, spiritual friends, we have to have them. That is where everything starts. Uh, that's where everything begins. You know, we have to have, uh, someone should inspire us. Uh, to 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 practice the Dhamma, so and then when you when you have that such association, then we get to listen to the Dhamma. The second factor that will help us to attain a stream entry or have panya is to listen to the Dhamma. Because when we have spiritual teachers and friends, then we get a chance to listen to the Dhamma. The first two is kind of external conditions, like you know, having good teachers, good friends around, and then listening and learning the Dhamma. But then there are two factors that are more internal. Again, you know, you find this uh, the uh, uh, stage called Yoniso Manasikara, his wise reflection. Yoniso Manasikara is a very important key term in the teaching of the Buddha. That is actually, you know, uh, understanding the, the, uh, the origin, the causal uh, relation of our experiences and mainly like tracing our experience to the beginning point and understanding the, the causal um, development of our experience. For example, if you are going through anger, you experience anger, you learn, remember the teachings of the Buddha about anger that you have learned from your spiritual teachers and friends. You try to connect that, you know, teaching of, about anger with your own personal experience that you're having. You are seeing, am I, am I really exp 
uh, seeing what Buddha has said about the anger, you try to compare and reflect, and then you can actually analyze our experience of anger exactly how I start to feel angry. You can explore it and and maybe you know go back in experience. You know how how I came to this point of being angry. What what happened just before that, and you can mentally kind of go back and analyze exactly when I start to feel like this. And you'll be able to go to the point where you saw something or heard something, or maybe you, you know, um, you know, um, you touch something, some kind of sensory experience that that will that triggers this feeling of anger. So you will go, you do this reflection and analyzing backward and, and find the origin uh, point of the anger and see the causal, you know, uh, causal progress and causal relation of this, you know, state of the mind. So that's called Yoniso Manasakara and, and re, uh, wisely reflecting on the Dhamma and then and using our Samaditi, you know, um, uh, as, a way, as a framework to analyze our present experiences. So that is that practice is called Yoniso Manasakara, that constant reflecting, constant uh, interpreting of our experience based on the right view. And in that, so that's the third factor, again, you know, and helping us to go deeper and deeper into our realization. The last one is called practicing in accordance with the Dhamma. Dhamma, Dhamma, Patipati. Again, practicing. So this is quite, you know, connected with, you know, three levels of understanding that we just didn't learn uh, earlier. So it's the same thing. As you see, the Buddha is teaching the same thing from different perspectives. So if we at least know like the teaching that Buddha has given from one perspective, and if you truly practice this, you get the point. Sometimes maybe learning a little bit more perspectives can be more helpful. But this particular verse that we are, we are, we are learning today is emphasizing us simply because we know the same facts from, from many, 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 many different perspectives may not, uh, may, may, may not necessarily enough, you know. And you know, it's, but then we have to go into deep and deeper level. So again, uh, four factors uh, that will help us to you know have deeper wisdom. So again, this this these four factors also uh, showing that two are coming from outside, two are coming from inside. Again and again, what we can find here is the emphasis on importance of practicing what what we have learned and. And that's the you know the encouragement I want to do uh, in our last you know, um, session uh, uh, in this uh, verse in this in, in in our series. Okay, so now I would like to you know give an opportunity for us to have some discussion and allow you to have you know ask some questions. Okay, any questions from, you know, what you we discussed now? Uh, I see one question in the chat box, but I will answer that, you know, maybe later. <laughs> Anyone like to ask a question? Bante? Yes? Bante Billing here. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. I would like to ask about the, can you elaborate a bit about on Dharma is good in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end. What do you mean good? <laughs> okay. Can you just... Uh, thank okay, you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Beeling, for that question. Um, so, the, whenever, you know, the, the, whenever we, we talk about the teaching of the Buddha, we always say that, you know, term Kalyana is used there. Uh, and with the Buddha, the, when Buddha taught the Dhamma, he took time, he took you know care and time to to present the Dhamma like in a perfect way, in a complete way. Um, so I think the, the the in that you know uh, um, so therefore it says that the Dhamma is Kalyana at the beginning, 
Kalyana at the middle, Kalyana at the end. Because Buddha has given a complete path. Uh, and because, you know, sometimes we only explain the problem, but we may not give a solution. Sometimes you explain the problem, you give a solution halfway through, and then you don't have a, a solution all the way to the end. So we find some spiritual tradition, some philosophy, some teaching that you may have addressed an important human problem, but you really haven't given a complete solution to that. You know, so so some, sometimes we can be, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, in lost. So the, the the important quality of the Dhamma, or the teachings of the Buddhist, actually, it has a diagnosed or uh, important human predicament, human problem, and he has also ex uh, uh, explained uh, the the causes of it. And it's also explained the solution to it. It has also explained the path that, that leading to that solution. It's, it's a complete package. So, so here it says that good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the uh, at the end. But you know, maybe the good way to say that it's uh, it, it is complete. The teaching is the teachings is complete in in mainly to understand um, the problem of our suffering. Complete in the beginning, complete in the middle complete uh, at the end. Uh, that is, I think that is the meaning. So Buddha's teaching will not uh, make us, you know, uh, I mean, bring us somewhere and, you know, and, and drop us there. So it's a complete teaching from the beginning to the middle to the end and guiding us all the way to understand the Dukkha, understand the causes of the Dukkha, understand the way out of it, and, and then uh, giving a full path to overcome it. So, so I would say uh, the good, I think you asked the good, because the term is kalyana, like the, the kalyana at the beginning, kalyana at the middle, kalyana at the end. So you can translate it as good, but I would say maybe complete at the you know, uh, beginning, complete in the middle, complete uh, in the end. Thank you, Bante. Hmm. Yes, welcome, sister. Any other uh, questions or sharings? Bande, can I try asking one question? Yes, please. Yeah, just just curious. You know, like over here in the modern times, we are constant having so much distractions uh, and so on. Uh, compared to in Buddha's time, you know, I, I understand a lot more people have uh, lit very little dust in the eye, right? So, uh, um, and many people, many, um, there were many people who reached Ar Arahans. Was it because there were more people um, having that spiritual understanding, they were already practicing a lot more than compared to, uh, you know, in the modern days, uh, that we struggle. I don't know me like I struggle more, but I I wonder if I was born back in <laughs> those bit time, <laughs> would it be different? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, Michelle. You know for that question. Um. Uh. I would say actually to be born in a period where the Buddha is living. Uh. We. I mean, we have to have a lot of merits. And definitely, you know, we all are in a different stages of our, you know, develop if our spiritual journey. And you know, sometimes, yeah, if if we practice dharma in this life, and if we do not, you know, go all the way to the end, if we don't fully, you know, um, you know, get an enlightenment, but whatever practice that we are doing right now will be carried over to the next life. So the many of the you know people who actually you know lived at the time of the Buddha who became disciples of the Buddha has already have a certain you know uh, spiritual maturity. They only need a little bit little bit more correction and guidance, and they you know they quickly attain it. So uh, yeah, definitely you know um, that that is that can be one reason that they are prior practices. But we should remember that not everyone who lived at the time of the Buddha was even interested in listening to the Buddha. And of course, the, you know, Buddha, the Buddha was able to attract a lot of you know people, and he established a you know community of disciples. But I think at the time of the Buddha, there were less Buddhists than you know Buddha's you know passing away. 
Um, and then only after King Ashoka time, I think you know people start to realize the importance of teaching. And then only after King Ashoka time, Buddhism is spread even beyond India. But the, during the time of the Buddha, <laughs> there were disciples, <laughs> but not as many as uh, many uh, Buddhists as you know um, in, in in later centuries. Uh, so there were so many people, even at the time of the Buddha, who even didn't care to listen to the Buddha. Uh, but whoever came to the Buddha, who was attracted to the Buddha, was was were quite you know advanced in the in the practice. So therefore, in in times time wise, we cannot really say that you know one time we have people you know more people you know spiritually advanced. Uh, another time we have less people spiritually advanced. You know the population. I mean, you know, sansar is always you know similar. So there's always people with little dust in the eyes. There are always people in, with a lot of dust in the eye. So it's it's common. It, and, um, but I think uh, one good advantage of being around a good or like the Buddha or any other uh, advanced spiritual teacher is that, particularly the Buddha, because Buddha has a special knowledge. When a disciple you know come to him uh, him. He has a special knowledge to kind of you know examine exactly you know what um, what are the dominant defilements in this person. He can detect in which one is the prominent disciples. So he can give us a technique, meditative technique to really address that. And he also can have uh, uh, has the knowledge of understanding which is spiritual quality that has developed more in this person. Uh, and then what are the other spiritual qualities that he need to develop? Um, so and, and so Buddha has two knowledges. One is to understand the defilements of the uh, disciple and also understand the spiritual qualities. We call, you know, the five indriyas and, and how these indriyas have been developed. So therefore, Buddha was able to give a, a personally catered design, you know, <laughs> a teaching. It's like, you know, nowadays we talk about like, you know, um, uh, giving medicine, you know, analyzing your DNA, right? <laughs> like, so, so not like a common medicine, but in your, so analyzing your DNA, you know, we can, I mean, now it's still there in the experiment level, but it, people believe that in the future we can have more individualized, you know, medicine. Uh, so what, but, so if you meet the Buddha, Michelle, you know, Buddha was able to really examine you, maybe scan you, <laughs> And then really find out, you know, what's really wrong and what's really right, and exactly what defilements has to be, you know, um, removed. And he will give, uh, he will give you an individualized training program, <laughs> and and definitely as you know, part of noble for path. It's not away from noble for path. And that way, um, you'll be able to, you know, have a breakthrough very quickly. And if you remember that, you know, Chula Pantak and the monk who even cannot re memorize, you know, one verse for three months. And you know, other monks asked him to leave the monastery, and but you know, he met the Buddha, and Buddha gave him just one technique, you know, to rub uh, the piece of white cloth, <laughs> and long enough that you know, white cloth get dirty, and he was able to reflect on that and have you know, have a breakthrough, deep realization. So, so that's one benefit. So maybe you do more merits. <laughs> And then, but again, you know, it's, it's something that we had to do by ourselves. But if, we, if around the Buddha, we can have more, more, more uh, opportunity. Yeah. Okay, there's one question in the chat box. Uh, say that, uh, how do you know uh, you entered in the first jhana? Okay, jhana, jhanas are the higher levels of tranquility, peace that we achieved when you do meditation, that's part of samadhi. When you, when you talk about right samadhi, right concentration in the number eightfold path, the samadhi is explained uh, in terms of four jhanas. So the first jhana is the first level of you know, tranquility, first level of um, uh, uh, peace. Um, so the, the question is, that how do you know you enter the first jhana? Um, Okay, uh, let me say, the the mind, uh, the nature of the mind in the first jhana is is very very different from our ordinary mind. This is how we know our ordinary mind always preoccupied with you know our uh, with with our you know sensual objects. We always want to see something. 
We always want to hear something. We always want to touch something. We are always yearning, always to have some sens sensory gratification. Our normal mind is always looking for this sensory gratification. We, we, we cannot stay without having any, any stimulation. That is why we quickly, when people have nothing to do, they will just take their phone out and, and watch whatever, you know, thing in the phone. So we, we always have that tendency to stimulate our senses. So in the first jhana, the first thing that you appease is our need to see anything, our need to hear anything, our need to gratify any senses. You feel like internally contented without having to see, hear, smell, taste, any of thing. So the, the internal contentment of being away from the sensual objects sensual you know gratification that's one criteria you feel internally settled internally contented without having you know, without having any of these you know sensory stimulation and then um, then as a result is also you know wholesome and the one other quality is that because we will do, we will start our meditation based on uh, object of meditation like either we will you know use our breath as a focus to start uh, maybe we use the you know qualities of the Buddha with Hanusati, or you may start you know as a loving kindness. Um, so initially, initially, uh, we want to make a lot of effort to keep our attention on on the bread or in the, on the you know qualities of the Buddha or the loving kindness because our mind will have will have all other you know things to think about. Um, so actually, if, uh, uh, but through constant effort to regular practice uh, we develop our mastery of our ability to stay focused on that you know selected object actually when you select that object the either wholesome object like a buddha nusati or the neutral object like a like a uh, bread that helps us to be away from the sens sensual you know uh, uh, stimulation but uh, and then we feel content about it but you know, for, with the usual meditation, is we constantly make an effort, bring our attention back again and again. And next time again is disturbed, we are bringing it back in again and again. But there will be a point that you will experience, and then you feel like you need less effort. You are very easily in the bread. You are very easily in the in the you know the qualities of the Buddha. You are very easily in the state of loving kindness. You do not need much effort. Uh, you, you need a little bit effort. You still, you know, want to maintain your attention, but you don't need that much of effort. Um, it's like, you know, at the so so when you experience that, when you experience the two things, I would say that you you feel fully contented within, uh, without having to have any sensory stimulation, and then you feel quite comfortable with the object of the meditation and it's smoothly moving with a little effort, doesn't need a lot of struggle to be with the object. And then you are in the first jhana. There's another question. Bhante may I ask to practice experience Dhamma is by meditation only. Um, uh, is I think it's a good question. What do you mean by the practice of the Dhamma? Is it meditation only? I think meditation is the key, but not meditation only. And simply follow the Noble Eightfold Path. We have like right speech, right action, right livelihood, and right you know uh, uh, effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. So the the key part is the meditation, but it's actually also the practice with our speech, practice in our behavior, practice in our interaction with others. Practice, you know, in our, you know, um, um, you know, daily movement. You know, when you are, you know, working, when you are sitting, when you are, you know, driving. So I would say meditation is the key, but practicing uh, dhamma doesn't means only meditating. It's in, it also means, you know, living. I mean, following the right speech, right action, right livelihood, and all the items, you know, all the paths of the, you know, noble eightfold path. Okay, um, 
I'm so glad that you know you uh, all you know joined every Thursday evening for this you know series, and today we will conclude this you know um, uh, series. Uh, but you know, uh, we will. I will offer another series. You know, uh, next time when I get a chance, when I get an opportunity, uh, and um, so I the the I I conclude <laughs> the series with a good uh, verse. So don't worry about learning more and more and more. Now you know enough <laughs> by simply even focusing on this. You know, uh, six verses we have learned, and simply you know uh, uh, knowing what you already know. What you really needed now is to practice, <laughs> get into work, you know, and, and practice. Um, uh, so therefore, you know, we learned about how our mind can become uh, the, the best enemy, worst enemy in our own life. And our, our own mind can also become, you know, uh, the best friend, even more than uh, beneficial, more than our parents. That's what we learned in the first verse. So try to reflect on that and try to utilize our mind in that way. We also learn about, you know, how, you know, um, when we receive advice, instruction and guidance uh, uh, from our friends, when someone point out our weakness, don't get hurt, don't get upset and treat it as a treasure, you know, important thing. So keep practicing it. Many people will make comments. Many people will, you know, even blame you. Many people will criticize you. Don't be upset. And you use them. Use them as a way to, you know, grow. So we, we need to, you know, keep practicing uh, in, in that way. So I, you know, I encourage you, you know, uh, you should keep learning the Dhamma, but I think we should uh, move into practice. So that's uh, my encouragement. And uh, so I'm so glad, you know, thank you very much for your active participation and you know, committing to attend this class. Uh, I enjoyed um, and talking to you and, you know, sharing the Dhamma and it's also helping me to you know go back to the um, these important verses and reflecting and finding new meanings and new you know personal um, you know realization of these uh, verses okay before i you know uh, conclude and share the merits and sister do you have anything to share anything to uh, uh, say at the conclusion well, Bante, we sincerely thank you for dedicating your time over the past many weeks to guide us in the study of the dhammapada we look forward to more opportunities to learn and deepen our understanding of the Dharma under your guidance in the near future. Wishing you good health and happiness. Thank you, sister. Thank you, yeah. Sister Natasha, do you like to uh, add anything? Um, yeah, we'll talk to Bante at your convenience to give us another teaching again, another session in the future very soon. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I will. I'll start traveling. You know, I'll be in, in, in Sri Lanka also, but then I'll come to Malaysia in February. Mm. And uh, let's see if I, you know, in between, if I get a chance, you know, I will uh, uh, let you know. Okay, sure. Okay, thank you, everyone. Let's take this moment to share the merits. You know, we we learn this very important teachings of the Buddha, and uh, so we commit ourselves to reflect on these teachings and, and to practice, and then have a personal realization of what we have learned. So by doing this, we uh, generate us so much good karma, good so much good merits in our heart. Let us now share this merits with everyone else. First of all, let us think about our departed ancestors, our parents, grandparents, and anyone in, um, uh, in our life and uh, even including our teachers, think about them and may they all share our merits. May they all be benefited uh, by these merits. May they all have a smooth journey towards the enlightenment. Let us also share these merits with all other living beings, all the divine beings and all other beings. If there's any being in this world who like to share this merit, may he or she do so. May all living beings share this merits. May all living beings. Be well, happy, and peaceful. Idang mi nyati nang ho tu sukita hun tu nyate yo. Idang mi nyati nang ho tu sukita hun tu nyate yo. Idang mi nyati nang ho tu sukita hun tu nyate yo. 
ಸಂಪತ್ಯಾ ಸಂಬೆ ಸಂತಾನು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಸುಗಿ ಹೋತು Thank you Bante. Thank you Bante. Thank you Bante. Welcome sister. Thank you Bante. See you in Malaysia. You're most welcome. Yeah. You're most welcome. Thank you Bante. Suki Bante. Thank you brother. Thank you Bante. Thank you brother. You are welcome. Thank you Bante. Oh you are most welcome Anand. Yes. Were you listening? Yes. Okay. Do you remember any little thing? Sorry. What? Yes. Do you remember the lotus flower you learned yes last week? Yes. Are you a lotus flower or a lotus bud? A lotus bud? <laughs> yes. That's good. Yeah, you are a lotus bud. so but you can become a, a fully blossom lotus in future right yes yes so you have to make a determination i'll be a nice lotus flower to everyone so everyone will benefit uh, from me like your speech has to be very pleasant like a lotus flower and you know and how you help others has to be very pleasant like a lotus flower everybody like everybody likes lotus flower right yes no uh, yes yeah does anyone like garbage no no right but sometime you know our speech can be like garbage uh, very smelly right very bad sometime our behavior can be like garbage right do you like Do you like other people look at you like a garbage? No. No, right? Yes. But you know, but we can become a lotus. Right? Always being kind and pleasant, helpful. So then we will be like a lotus and we will even uh, inspire and uh, we will even uh, help others to be good too. Right? Okay. okay. Are, are you ready to be a lotus flower? give me thumbs up if you are ready good good <laughs> okay ananda so nice and wish you all the blessings for good health okay i wish you to have good health you may not get flu anymore okay be very strong in your immunity okay and study well and i will see you in february thank you bante okay thank you very see and february yes 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 okay ಸುಖಿ ಹೋತು 